somebody else uh, had taken over that now i had to you know get them off okay uh, um, can can you just uh, verify once i think one of you can um, confirm yeah ah uh, confirm Uh, no, Ravindra, it is still not there. I don't. No, no, it is came, there. Sir, you YouTube link is came. No problem. Sir, it, there, it sir. is coming now. It's coming. Hello. Ah, uh, just checking, sir. One second. Yeah, I think uh, now I can see. Ah, uh, still not, sir. I don't see it. Yeah, I too don't see it. sir i am able to see it but there are some 20 odd people are already there see it now on the home page yeah now it is there it is there no yes okay okay please carry on sorry my apologies i think there some issue no problem happens uh shall we you should really start from the beginning okay um good morning everyone thank you for joining us today today is the week 2 for indian webinar series introduction to computational drug design it is co organized by shodanga and pcr um i would like to thank our distinguished collaborators uh, for supporting us and also the it team of jss and manipal for hosting these sessions um so without any delay i think we should just start with our first session uh when the target protein structure is not there um during this course of presentation if you have any questions please feel free to drop them in the uh, chat section of the youtube link uh we will have a q and a session after the presentation Uh, shall i start shall we yes, yes. dr prashant please start okay your great okay thank you very much so let me share the screen first yeah and here is the full screen mode and let's see uh yeah can anybody confirm like uh, it is yes, visible, visible and audible audible okay great so thank you very much shelvia uh and thank you very much all of you for joining the session so as uh, today we are discussing about the problem when you don't have structure of protein available with you so what to do in such case so in drug discovery like uh, there can be a many various cases and conditions where, where which um, which might obstruct you to perform further research but again uh, it is not uh, really the thing uh, you will have all tools available with you to work with to resolve your issue so one of such tool is homology modeling so 
what is the thing here uh, whenever you don't have protein structure available with you so in that case you can perform homology modeling for your protein structure and you can proceed further for your drug designing project so this is what today we are going to discuss about uh, the homology modeling and its application so i'll start uh, from really something which is basics and we'll proceed through how to perform homology modeling at the end and we will have separate discussion session on it whatever questions you will have so stay tuned so uh, this is what uh, is my classical slide of basics of drug designing so as i always mention it follows the lock and key model and uh, the drug drug discovery research is all about fi about uh, finding the best key amongst all keys available in the database but to perform all those exercise you must know the structure of lock so there can be condition when the structure of lock is not available so what what to do in such case you need to generate a structure of lock so same thing is applicable in case of protein or your receptor so whenever you don't have structure of it you, uh, we need to develop that structure so that we proceed for further drug designing studies so as there are various receptor based or ligand based methods available for you to perform your drug designing research so we have seen uh, many of such uh, uh, examples of structure based drug designing and in consecutive lectures we will see some ligand based drug designing so or higher level of uh, modeling studies like molecular dynamic simulation studies so but here in this uh, presentation i'll be mostly focusing on uh, homology modeling of the protein structure and once you, you will have homology model of protein structure ready you can proceed for the structure based drug designing so this is what the idea about so what you can do with uh, protein modeling so uh, so this is these are the tools which are available with schrodinger suit you will have all those tools available with you and uh, you can basically build the uh, structure of your target protein using homology modeling then you can analyze that particular structure using site uh, binding site uh, identification or site map uh, tool which we have seen before you can analyze how it looks like how the protein structure look like how binding site look like and you can use that information for further uh, molecular modeling studies or computer related drug design studies you can also refine your protein structure or not only uh, it is not only about the refinement of your homology model but uh, you can also refine whatever crystal structure is available with you so that tool is also available uh, in the schrodinger for example if you have a crystal structure of low resolution and you want to refine it further that also you can refine and you can also perform molecular dynamic simulation studies on your protein structure or biological target or protein ligand complex to refine it further or to study it further so these are the various things which are available with you with the schrodinger suit so now let's start something about the basics uh, so basics of protein means how protein is made up of so basically protein is made up of 20 amino acid residues so there there are many such residues for example alanine cysteine aspartic acid glutamic acid and many so this number is there are 20 naturally occurring amino acid residues through which a protein is made up of so whenever two amino acid residues uh, get together they form a peptide linkage which we call it as c o n h so peptide linkage joins two amino acid residues and in this way this uh, this uh, polymer continues to grow and once it grows completely you will have a tertiary structure of protein so it ultimately gives you the structure of protein so at very basics you need to understand how it is made up of what are the big building blocks of uh, your protein structure means if you start it from uh, very basics you, you will able to understand how it is and how you can use that information for further uh, your drug designing studies so let's see there are few terms which we need to understand in case of protein so basically whenever you have a sequence of uh, amino acid residues for example all that amino acid residues which are abbreviated in single uh, letter code 
so whenever such sequence is available we called it as a primary sequence so you can say it as a fasta sequence also and whenever this all amino acid residue join together through peptide linkage which is conh it forms a long chain so that long chain has no structure available uh, no structure present in it it is just a simple polymer chain so we call it as a primary structure of protein but as it started growing as it uh, environment favors uh, the folding of the structure it folds into various uh, substructures which we called it as a secondary structures and those secondary structures are, are alpha helix helix or beta sheet structure so it looks like helix it has a helical turns or beta sheets are some parallel strands which comes together so it forms secondary structures so whenever we say secondary structure means some definite structure is available with us and there can be various loops which are kind of distorted and there is no structure present with loop it just folds like a thread and we call it as loop when all those things come together like alpha helix beta sheets and loops all to uh, all together they form a tertiary structure of protein so from primary structure it ends up to secondary structure secondary structure further folds to the tertiary structure and this is the functional form of protein which you will have from let's say protein data bank or from homology modeling is the tertiary structure of protein it has definite shape it has definite volume it has definite function to perform so this is what is our biological target but even sometimes those all tertiary structures like protein structures come together and they form a quaternary complex means there can be number of tertiary structures come together and form a big assembly that assembly also has specific function specific structure we call it as a quaternary structure so simple example is a virus capsid so virus capsid is made up, made up of lot of uh, proteins which come together and form a quaternary structure so or actin filament or there are uh, many such proteins which are which exist in the quaternary form because it needs to pump, perform some function so that's why they come together and form bigger structure so this is what is the basics of uh, how the structure grows and there are many such experimental methods through which one can find out the uh, structure of protein so those methods are very popular method is x ray crystallography through which uh, experimentalist uh, <coughs> map the electron density and find out the structure of protein uh so this is one one of the method which is reported in protein data bank so you will find many of such structures which are uh, solved through x ray crystallography then there is another method or which is nmr crystal nmr method for structure resolution so uh, so basically nmr is because it works only in the solution form so you will have uh, the protein structure in so solution form which is highly flexible in nature so there can be various conformations of loops present in the same structure uh, in case of wherever nmr structure is available nmr structure also has some limitations like whenever protein is less than 30 kilodalton then only it works if it is more than that then one need to go for x ray crystallography or other methods so uh, there is also one of a uh, good method is cryo uh, em method so cry through cryo em actually one uh, resolves the big assembly of structures like quaternary complexes so those structures are also being uh, 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 being solved through cryo em method and nowadays this is very much popular method for uh, solving big protein structures so uh, whenever you visit protein data bank you will find uh, various uh, experimental methods through which structure has been resolved so you will mostly find the x-ray nmr and cryo em methods and whatever is available with you one need to decide which method uh, which structure i should go with but overall x-ray crystallography give, gives you good kind of resolution that you can use it for further drug designing so which are those that databases where you will find all those structures so one of the very popular database is protein data bank so you can see pdb so where you will find mostly all of those structures but it is not only limited to protein data bank there are many such databases like uh, protein data bank japan or uh, european protein data bank so there also you can find protein structures where extreme experimentalist normally deposit deposits their structure once it is published so you can always look into such databases where it, you can find the 
uh, experimental structure to work with so what if uh, this is what the idea of this today's uh, session is what if you don't have the structure of protein available in the database so normally if you find it in database that's well and good if you don't find it in database then you need to ask question to yourself can i develop a model for this particular protein so the best answer is you need to look into the sequence database sequence database is kind of uniprot database if you have a fasta sequence of your protein available in uniprot database then yes the answer will be yes you can develop a protein structure using homology modeling method for the protein of your interest so first thing you want you need to go to is uniprot database and there you need to search for the name of protein of your interest and you need to find whether the amino acid residue sequence is available with uh, you or not so in the basics of homology modeling like once you have a structure of uh, once you have a sequence of amino acid residue sequence of your protein and uh, then you can go for template based homology modeling so the very basics of homology modeling is just one statement like whatever is if sequence is similar then structure is also similar so you just need to remember this term sequence similarity is equal to structural similarity so similarity means whenever similarity comes into picture it always refers to the two uh, different things means you need to compare these two things and what are those two things is the template structure and the target structure so this target structure means your unknown structure for which you don't have a structure available in any databases and you need you wanted to build the model for this particular structure we call it as a target structure which is unknown and template structure is the structure which is available uh, which is already available in the protein data bank but it is somehow similar to that of your target structure so you need to basically find out that best template structure available in the structural database and then as i said if sequences are similar stru uh, structure is also similar so if you see like sequence is similar in your template structure and your target structure uh, target sequence then of course you can build the homology model of it so you just need to align those uh, sequences to see how similar it is if it is uh, having good similarity then yes you can build the model of your unknown protein structure so that's what we call it as a homology model of the protein sequence and here you can see whenever we generate a homology model it almost generate the similar type of model whatever is available in the template structure so here you can see orange color and green color so green color is basically your uh, template structure which is already available and you try to build the exact similar structure as that of template structure for your target structure means you for which you wanted to build a homology model out of it and in this way it it just build the structure as just similar as that of template structure so there is a there are various steps which you need to follow for doing the homology modeling specifically template based homology modeling so what are those things what are the steps you need to follow overall so you can see it's a simple protocol which i have outlined for doing homology modeling which starts from as i said first thing you need to ask is whether protein sequence is available in the database so you just need to go to uniprot database and search the protein of your interest and see if you have sequence available amino acid residue sequence available in for this particular protein if it is available then yes you need to retrieve that sequence once you will have that sequence with you there is a method called blast p means you need to find out the suitable template structure for your homology modeling so for that we run blast p search this is nothing but the search algorithm to find out the best suitable template structure out of it and at the end of this uh, search uh, things you will have various parameters to consider for example how much is the sequence identity and similarity between template and target how much is the query coverage 
how whether there are missing residues present in template what is the resolution like if it is x-ray crystal then what is resolution of uh, this particular template structure whether it consists of ligand present in it or not or what is the pdb id of it so all those things you need to consider before choosing a final uh, template structure which comes out of this blast piece search so once you will have the best template available with you you just need to align those two sequences using the software and whenever you align those sequences there can be various methods like you want to go for single template alignment or multiple template alignment or secondary structure based alignment so these are the things which you need to consider uh, while doing target template sequence alignment so once you will have best alignment available with you you just need to go for model building that's the last step of uh, model building so even for model building you will have different methods like knowledge based method or energy based method or do you want to consider ligands means do you want to import whatever ligands present in template structure into the uh, target protein structure for example if there are cofactors like nadp or atp so such things you can import inside the homology model so you can also uh, further build your backbone or side chain amino acid uh, side chains of the amino acid residue you can add a missing uh, loops or side chains in it so the or you can generate various chimeras so these are the things which you can do using homology mod actual homology modeling exercise so once you will have a model available with you you need to check that model whether it is correct or not whether it is reliable or not so for uh, checking of the protein structure there are various uh, things available so for example protein reports which uh, find out which are the very whether there are any steric clashes or whether there are any deviations from the ramachandran plot which is one of the classical method to analyze protein structure whether it is correct good or bad so uh, then there it can be you can compute rmsd you can analyze the binding site for validation of your homology model whether it is good or bad so these are the things uh, if it is good enough then yes you can proceed further with this particular model but let's say if it is not good enough if it has many steric clashes or deviation to ramachandran plot then you need to definitely refine that model so there are various method to refine that model for example there is loop refinement or energy minimization or uh, rotamer exploration so these are the various methods through which one can refine the model once you refine your model again you need to go back and check uh, whether it is correct or not whether it follows all those criteria or not and if it is if it satisfies all those criteria then, then yes you can proceed further for the uh, further for your drug designing studies using that homology model so this is what the general protocol which you need to follow in building your template based homology model but again as it looks like very complex but these are the all things which works in a background and you will have simple tool to build a homology model in schrodinger suit so it just three clicks uh, panel in which you just need to uh, three times you need to click on button and then that's it it will generate a homology model for you but these are the various things which you need to consider and of course software considers all those things in the background so at some point you really don't need to worry about it software take care of most of the things but remember these are the various things which are working in the background so basically how this particular homology modeling is being performed so as i said like it is because it is template based so whatever if sequence is similar means structure is similar so what software does uh, in background is it aligns your target sequence to the template sequence and once it aligns it looks for the how much query coverage is which amino acid residues are being aligned to each other how many similarities is is, is there how many how many identical amino acid residues are there and whatever is uh, present in the template structure it tries to copy all those information about amino acid residue sequence in your protein structure and somehow it builds the your target structure based on the template structure and here you can see in template structure if you find helix it in target structure also it will build helix and uh, in this way if it finds a beta sheet then in 
target structure also it will generate a beta sheet again the complex algorithm works behind it and finally it gives you the similar type of structure as that of template structure and uh, you get once you get that model you need to go for further refinement or validation of this model and again this is what is the iterative process which one need to follow to build a exact good reliable homology model so there are some things which you need to consider while building homology model that it requires a good template structure so because everything is being uh, copied or everything is being uh, learned from the template structure so it should have good template structure that you can get it from the sequence alignment or blast search and those various parameters which we discussed before you need to consider all those parameters to find out the best template structure out of it and uh, once you get the template structure you need to align it properly because this alignment is very very crucial like based on alignment only it is going to uh, copy all those uh, things which are present in the template structure into the target structure so that's why alignment is very very cr crucial and one need to take a look at alignment uh, whether it is good or bad then a uh, very important thing come into picture is the force field that also you need to consider you should be dealing with the best force field out of it to which because force field is the one which uh, governs all type of um, interactions bonding parameters non bonding parameters which interactions are being happened inside the protein structure all those things are uh, considered through force field only so that's the reason why you need to consider all those things so as i said like it requires a good template structure so template can be first of all it can be a single template uh, which is available for your structure if it is single template that's very well and good you if you are not happy with single template you can also go with the multiple template structure or, or you can generate a consensus model out of many uh, various template structure for generating a single model you can also generate chimeric or composite model out of your protein for example there is a particular region which is differing in the protein structure for example here this is the protein structure and this green color domain is only being changed and rest of the things are being same so in that case also you can generate a chimeric model out of uh, your out of the homology modeling method you can also generate a dimer or multimers in case of big assemblies or quaternary structures there is a method for gpcr specific modeling because gpcr are the structures which are transmembrane structure and it needs a specific treatment so those that tre specific treatments need to be uh, incorporated in the software and with schrodinger you have that option available for gpcr specific uh, homology modeling and most of the software lacks such option then there is a loop modeling which comes under refinement of the structure and you need to perform loop modeling in very nice way to get a reliable model because loops are the distorted structure and one need to take care of it it is very very critical but again as i said with schrodinger everything comes handy like for each option you will have a single tool which is single click button thing and you it will take care of everything you just need to decide which model you need to go further with the next thing comes into the sequence alignment as i said it is very crucial so you can see here the sequence alignment of various uh, kinase proteins and once you align this mini sequence you will find which amino acid residues are differ between two sequence for example here in the at this particular region there is difference though this particular valine residue is conserved amongst all proteins but still in two proteins it differs so you need to based on that information you need to think which more which template structure i should go further with or there can be various regions which are missing in uh, your stru uh, template structure so that also you need to think of there are various anchor residues for example in kinase uh, you will have anchor residues like dfg loop which is present in every protein structure as you see it is well conserved so it should align to each other so this this is what alignment means you need to have that uh, perfect alignment while building your homology model out of it so not only that but you can also have information about which ligand is present inside this particular template structure and what is the biological activity of it so if you look into biological activity you should go with if you are going for further drug designing studies then it is worth to go with 
highest active uh, ligand molecule which is present inside it because it represents the bioactive conformation of protein and ligand so that's why the activity um, biological activity of ligand is also critical in such cases so once you will have that uh, uh, good template structure and good sequence available with you so next critical thing comes with the force field because as i said force field is the thing which governs all type of bonded non bonded interactions whenever two atoms are bound to each other it is a harmonic bond and if three atoms are there then it's a angle which is there between uh, three atoms if there are four atoms available then it's a torsion angle or even the atoms are not connected to each other it follows the various non covalent interactions like van der waal or electrostatic interaction and that need to be taken care of with very very um, critically that needs to be taken care of so that's why a force field is very important one of such example here is you can see there are these are two amino acid residues which are present in the protein structure and it uh, these two amino acid residues should be stably interacting with each other to maintain the integrity of structure and with the force field basically you can see how different force field treats it as a differently and uh, it because of that different treatment it changes the conformation of amino acid residues inside the protein structure and that's the reason why you need to always uh, consider the force field very very critically you need to look for all those interaction whether it is in the right conformation or not so that's why i suggested to use the best force field which uh, for schrodinger it is opls3 force field which is available with you so that you need to think of so other than that uh, one of the method is loop sampling method so for loops also we need to have very good type of method uh, available uh, in the software to treat all those loops like loops can, loops are because loops are basically distorted structure so it might have various conformations present in it so you need to sample all those conformation and loop can be extended from let's say Three amino acid residue to five or ten or fifteen or twenty amino acid residue longer loop, and one need to uh, one need to treat those loop structures very um, in very uh, exhaustive manner. So you can see here uh, uh, not only that particular loop structure, but there is implicit solvation method which is uh, also reliable because of because of this environmental effect only loop gets fold. into the protein structure and for that you need to consider that environmental factor while building your homology model for example here you can see the protein is immersed in the water which is explicit water but because we need our result faster so we can't consider it as a explicit water so we have a specific uh, option called implicit solvation model in which it it considers the that environmental environmental factor of that particular water which is present around the protein and because of this environmental factor your loop gets fold in, inside the protein structure or it gets stable inside the protein structure so one of the study uh, according to that study the statistics uh, they have compared various loop length and number of cases uh, in which for example here the loop length was 14 and the, uh, in such way there are 36 various protein structures they have studied and even out of that <coughs> they came to know about average backbone rmsd for this particular loop with respect to the uh, with respect to the experimentally determined structure is 0.6 which is very very uh, close to the exact same confirmation means software is able to Uh, generate the exact loop conformation as of reported by the experimentalist even the loop length is like 14 amino acid residue long and in this way they have performed various loop length like up to even 20 amino acid residue and they have seen like even for longer loops it has uh, uh, the rmsd value with respect to the experimentally determined structure is 1.5 so that's very very critical in case of homology modeling one need to have that reliability in the loop sampling so that's why i always say like uh, schrodinger is predicting a better structure out of all available information so one need to use that refined loop option to generate a uh, various loop samples uh, sampling of the loop so here i have listed there are various challenges which you come across in while doing homology modeling that we should not ignore 
we always need to check all those things whether uh, you are facing any challenge uh, challenge in doing it so for example as i said like uh, structure alignment is very it should be accurate enough and template should be suitable so if you have high sequence identity and similarity then most of the things get solved one don't need to worry about the homology model which is being built so that's why you always need to look for the very high sequence identical template structure so if you find it it all solves the thing but if it is having less sequence identity or less sequence similarity then you need to intervene in between for sequence alignment or while doing homology modeling you need to check uh, iteratively all of your structures like which structure give you the best you need to refine it so it needs some human intervention in case of low sequence identity so that you need to consider and because it is all so one don't need to worry about it because it's very routine problem uh, in case of homology modeling because it is all depending on the whatever experimental data available with you like a template structure which is available in protein data so uh, so sequence alignment and suitable template is one of the biggest challenge which uh, makes your life easy or difficult based on the high sequence of the identity and low sequence identity but uh, even once you build the model you need to perform model refinement for that uh, we have various options like side chain confirmations you need to take care of you need to consider loop confirmations or binding site confirmation so these are the things uh, after building a model you will need to look into it and you need to see whether uh, on all those parameters your model is good enough and there are various type of common errors which could happen in say, while building a homology model like rotamer packing or very distortion present in the loop or which type of loops it looks like and uh, and all those things comes because of that misalignment during a uh, sequence alignment so that's the reason why you always need to look into sequence alignment and check whether it is correct or not and uh, as i said like uh, it might happen if you choose the wrong template structure if you are choosing correct template structure with high sequence identity then of course these things doesn't come into picture because it will be already taken care of and there are various uh, based on identity there are limiting factors like for example if you are dealing with um, more than 75% of identity then it will definitely give you good homology model out of it with high speed and high accuracy but uh, let's say if you are dealing with uh, sequence identity up to less than 75% let's say 50 to 75% then you need to do little bit tweaking in alignment and you also need to go for loop modeling uh, which might consumes little bit of time but if it is less than that like 30 to 50% then then of course alignment becomes very very crucial and human intervention becomes very very critical and again like if it is less than 30 then one need to think uh, very very uh, critically that uh, it, whether it is giving me a good model or not you need to check at each and every point and you need to reiterate the same process again and again to get the best homology model out of it so even once you get the homology model out of it uh, there are many such parameters to be uh, which you need to confirm whether your model is good enough or not but uh, with schrodinger as i always say life becomes easy so you will have a single click option called protein quality and reliability report through which you can consider all those parameters which you need to consider for example ramachandran plot you can have in just single click uh, you can have various type of deviations like bond angle deviation bond length deviation steric clashes all those things you can see it in very handy tool in just single click or uh, even if you want to see all things holistically you will have protein reliability report option in which all those things are being shown in just one view for example here wherever you find uh, green color means it's there is no problem with this particular parameter for example here it says uh, green color with pdb resolution means it says it is okay or binding site packing it says it is okay protein packing also it says it is okay but wherever you find red color means you need to take care of those things for example here red color missing loop uh, option is there it means there are some loops which are missing in the protein structure as the size of this red color increases means there are some serious problems occurring inside the protein structure for example here in particular case steric clashes and it's a big circle in red color means 
th there are many steric clashes present in the protein structure that you need to take care of so how to take care of it is simple by performing energy minimization you might get rid of steric clashes so this is the way holistically one can have a single picture out of uh, for your protein structure validation and your your goal is uh, to improve this all properties in the protein structure so as i always said like if you uh, at the end if whatever model you get it is not very straightforward process you need to reiterate the process in case of complications for example if you don't have suitable template structure if you have low sequence identity then yes you need to reiterate the process you need to refine your model and check for the parameters you need to again refine the model and check for the parameters and in this way afterwards finally you will get the good model out of it so always remember computer aided drug designing is always a iterative process so never get frustrated out of it sometime you get, if you are lucky enough you get easy answers sometime uh, it might take some time to get the answer but one thing is for sure if you do it critically then success is always yours so with this point i would like to acknowledge my team who are working in bangalore round the clock to solve your all issues and i am thankful to all of uh, uh, my team for your uh, who are supporting you in all possible ways so with this i conclude the uh, Uh, session and discussion on our uh, homology modeling homology model generation i am i thank you to all of you for joining us and listen the lecture carefully and at the end i would like to open the session for questions if you have thank you very much thank you dr prajwal for the presentation uh, we have received a few questions as a reminder if you have any questions please add them in the chat window of the youtube video and we'll get them added to our list so the first question is if x ray crystal structure um, are already available for a protein is it necessary to carry out homology mod model modeling uh, for such protein Uh, no need if x ray crystal structure is available means somebody has already experimentally solved it then there is no point in going for predict uh, predictions based on this model you can directly use it uh, for your further studies but uh, again as i said you need to go through protein preparation wizard to resolve all those problems which are present in the structure thank you uh, the next question is 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 it a good idea to use cryo em structure for computational studies uh, so yes but one need to think of because whenever you are dealing with cryo em structure it has a low resolution like 3.5 to 5 or 15 angstrom resolution and with that angstrom actually uh, the visibility of atomic density is very less but you need to think if you don't have any other option available other than cryo em structure then yes it is okay to go with it but you need to refine that structure first using uh, let's say uh, uh, either protein preparation wizard or uh, using molecular dynamic simulations and get the reliable structure out of it and proceed for further studies if you have some option of x ray crystal structure then that's will end so going further with cryo em structure carefully thank you for the answer uh, so the next question is uh, can we use a template from two different experimental methods for example from x ray and cryo em uh, to build your model uh, absolutely yes it is fine until and unless we can manage with the good sequence uh, good sequence alignment then yes you can use it from different uh, methods thank you uh, so the next question is uh, how to choose template protein structure from available uh, different protein i think the person meant like after the blast search when we get a lot of hits how do we choose which one is the right template to use yeah so for that uh, here i have mentioned few of the parameters like sequence identity and similarity then what is query coverage it should be maximum identity and similarity should be maximum then there should not be any missing residues in the template structure its resolution should be good it should be with ligand if possible and that could be most active ligand 
so based on these parameters you need to decide the best suitable template structure right uh, so the next question is what should be the structure format while preparing for homology modeling will it be dot pdb i think it means the output or yeah i mean it's fine like the structural <laughs> format should not uh, you should not bother about it if you are doing doing with uh, schrodinger then of course it will generate it in a mae format which is supported by schrodinger so one don't need to worry about it for protein structure you can use mae or pdb format right uh, so the next question is what is the algorithm behind maestro's homology modeling tool so algorithm is same so these are the various steps which software follows in background so this is what the uh step by step manner it will give you the final homology model out of it there can be various uh, methods which we one can see like knowledge based method in case of high sequence identity or similarity you can go with knowledge based methods or if you believe like uh, knowledge based knowledge based method is not working fine with you one can go for energy based method in which uh, a software tries to identify some of the regions in the protein structure based on energetic energetic values so these are the things which we need to take care of right um so the next question is um while uh, doing the homology modeling if your protein of interest uh, the structure is not present in the same uh, organism can you use uh the protein structure from a different organism in order to build the homology mod model for example if a protein is present in e coli but you are trying to build a homology mo model for a uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis for example can that be done yes it is fine if you get a good sequence uh, identity and good sequence similarity then yes it is fine with any other organism structure thank you uh, so if the sequence similarity is less than 80% um, how many templates should you use so uh, the straight forward answer is uh, always remember one thing if you have option to go for single template alignment or single template modeling that's the best way don't go for multiple template until and unless you have no choice available because whenever multiple templates come into picture complexity increases and reliability decreases so if you have a single template available and the sequence similarity can be even if it is less than 50% and single template is available then also it is okay to go with it so i would say like 80% is very high sequence similarity so 80% like you don't need to worry about it. so if it is less than 50% then only you need to think of multiple template homology uh, otherwise no need to even think of it it's all fine thank you uh, so the next question is uh, how do we read ramachandran plot so how do we read ramachandran plot so uh, the simple thing is uh, ramachandran plot you can see here on the bottom left uh, the, uh, it is divided into various uh, regions like red color is the most allowed region then uh, yellow color region is the allowed region and white color region is disallowed region so these dots if you see this dot represents each amino acid residue backbone torsions so you are this dot should not fall in white color region because it is disallowed region so you would need to get all those dots inside red color or yellow color region so this is what the best way to read it but uh, at any given point if you want to read more about it so simply type ramachandran plot in google and you will get the first link from wikipedia where uh, it is all explained in details thank you uh, so the next question is if we have an apo structure should we opt for homology modeling so if you have apo structure then structure is there you can proceed further uh, for further studies like all uh, molecular docking or induced fit docking so if structure is available then no need to go for 
homology modeling. Right. Uh, so the next question is. Um, Okay, I'm reading it as it is. Um, is there any database available to do Ramachandran plot? So, I think question you need to tweak a little bit, but uh, you don't need to worry about it. Like it's just a single click and there is no database for Ramachandran plot. It generates based on the whatever structure available with you. So with Schrodinger, you will have a simple tool to generate it. It's just a single click uh, option. Right. Uh, so the next question is while doing the homology modeling conventionally after multiple sequence alignment, we have to build a PSM profile. Does Schrodinger also do that? What is meant by PSM? I have no idea. So if uh, Surbi, you could just explain that to us. So I have a feeling it's from some other software. Position specific matrix. Okay, so uh, it's not only about PSM, but there are a number of factors which are available uh, as uh, with respect to various softwares. Every software has different ways to analyze it. Uh, so, I mean, whatever is available with Schrodinger, those are the essential things which you will have. But it is uh, again not limited. You go to any other software, any other web server, you will find some other parameters. But at the end, uh, what is take home message? Take home message is. Uh, you need to fall within the limit. You need to have all things in allowed allowed uh, regions. So uh, there can be Z score, there can be red plot, there can be PSM, there can be PROSA. So there are many such things which are available. So if you again uh, with homology modeling, you always need to think if your model is well well good. Like it all fo follows the Ramachandran plot and steric clashes and this protein reliability report parameters, then everything will be uh, taken care of. So you don't need to look for hundreds of such parameters at the end. It is all being covered. Right. So the next question is, is there a database available where you can get uh, homology model proteins? Yeah, there are databases available like Swissprot database where people used to deposit the homology model of protein if it is available. Uh, but again, uh, whatever homology model is, it is all predicted structure only. They can be false positives or uh, true negatives type of model. Whatever you get it from such databases, you need to revalidate it. So that's the best possible way. So if you get such model, get it, but don't believe it blindly. Well, revalidate it. If it is good enough for you, then only proceed further. But there are databases available. Uh, so the next question is, um, how many templates can be used to generate a model? So it means like the upper limit, maybe. So there is nothing like upper limit. It's all up to you. How many more uh, templates you want to use, but my suggestion is always there. Try to use as less as possible templates. If it is single template, that's the best scenario. If it is two template or three template, it's fine. If it is more than that, the reliability will be very, very low. But you can use hundreds of template if you want. Um, can you please tell us the need of blast analysis and is that available using Schrodinger suites? Yes, it is available with Schrodinger suite. So blast is nothing but the method to find out best template based on sequence identity or similarity. It's one of the method of alignment of two sequences. So it is available with Schrodinger suit. Right. Uh, so the next question is, uh, when we do a two template based modeling, what is the importance of RMSD with respect to template in such case? Um, is there a possibility that the model can have a confirmation in between them. Yes, so possibility is always there for anything. And the RMSD means always remember RMSD value should be less. It can be up to zero also means it should be less. Whatever it is, whatever possible less you will have, that's the better thing. 
right uh i think you already answered the next question uh so when the pdb is available for e coli instead of homo sapien then uh, do we need to go for homology modeling yeah i mean uh, which uh, which organism protein you want to study so if pdb structure is available for e coli and you want to study a uh, human protein then answer is yes you need to go for homology modeling so because uh, as organism changes amino acid residue sequence change and as sequence change the structure might change so you cannot use uh, e coli structures to study human protein you need to build a homology model right uh, so the next question is which is the better method knowledge based or energy based it depends on your requirement uh, so whatever information available with you so knowledge based method has own significance when you have high sequence identity or high sequence similarity knowledge based method works better but if you have low sequence identity and similarity in that in that case uh, you need to go for energy based method okay so the next question is if in the protein reliability report many of the parameters are not good then what are the other options to go for except to change the template yeah so what are the other ways to change it you can perform uh, loop refinement you can perform energy minimization you can perform rotamer search you can perform side chain search so these are the various things which are available with us to refine your model to get your protein reliability report better uh what should we do if we do not get any protein template for the homology modeling so if you don't get any protein template then i would not suggest you to go for such a homology modeling method because it will not generate any type of reliable model it's all template based homology modeling so that's why a template is template should be there right um what is forbidden region in ramachandran plot so i mean there are a few regions which are uh, for example uh, uh, you can see amino acid residues like prolines and glycine so those are the amino acid residues are kind of exceptions to the ramachandran plot so they can fall within a disallowed region and there should not be any worry out of it so it will be fine right uh i think they mean dft uh shall we i'm sorry i think i missed uh, there was voice cut in this sorry sorry can you hear me now yeah it's fine. okay sorry um so the question is is uh the uh, density factor calculation compulsory for a molecule in in silico study i think they mean dft calculation maybe i'm not sure okay um okay let's just one okay um how chiral molecules respond to the target protein is there any impact or special arrangement in homology model so no i think that question needs to be refined so you can see even uh, there are various chiral molecules available that can have huge impact on biological activity like uh, r isomer is most active and s isomer is completely inactive so there are such examples of drug molecules so you always need to consider such parameters and with respect to homology model so yes uh, according to the stereo isomer which is active uh, protein ac acquires a particular shape in binding pocket and not only that 
it is vice versa also like uh, because of in, in because of that shape of binding pocket only that particular chiral molecule can fit inside it so yes it has impact one need to take care of it also right uh, the next question is is there any successful story with homology modeling there are n number of studies available you just need to type it in a google search and you will find a lot of papers available on it so the next question is is there an application where we can find the pockets in the protein yes uh, we have seen it in uh, previous lectures there is a tool called sitemap through which we can identify the various pockets inside the protein structure uh, so the next question is um, if the dfg in state in available is available for a kinase then for type 2 inhibitor identification what will be better a homology model for the inactive or out state or induced fit docking would help so uh, if you will have option to build a homology model for active state based on the active template then that's the best possible way if you by chance don't have such option available like uh, active state template is not available then next way is induced fit docking Okay, I think we have come to the last question. Uh, is there a basic course where we can learn homology modeling and MDMS? So it's here. <laughs> you are on the right platform. So this is what is the basics of homology modeling, and in consecutive lectures, you will see how to do it actually in in the software. And for MDS, the next session will be on MDS. Just stay uh, tuned. So. Just after five minutes, it will it will start, and you will have all the basics of molecular dynamics simulations. Also. Okay, sorry. Uh, spoke too soon. Uh, so there is a clarification by the uh, by the person who asked the question before. So they are just asking if DST is compulsory um, to go for the in silico study. DFT. Yeah. So. i mean uh, it all depends on you what problem you want to address so always remember there are n number of studies n number of methods which are available to solve the problem but you need to ask yourself what is the problem which you want to address what is the problem you want to solve whether is it possible to solve it through this particular method or i need to look for any other method so if you will have answer for it then yes you can use molecular mechanics method you can use dft methods you can use qm methods so all methods are available you need to think of the problem which you want to address right uh, so the next question is uh, do all these tools like pocket prediction target preparation and homology modeling etc do they also work on rna targets yeah as such uh, they should work but uh, with site map uh, it is specifically optimized for the uh, protein amino acid residues so it will give you the best result for protein for uh, dnas for rnas you need to think like uh, rnas and dnas has double helical or single helical structure and it has very specific grooves which are my major groove and minor grooves so in such cases like uh, it is very unlikely that you need to go for such pocket uh, prediction studies because it's all definite things which are present but pro in case of protein it's very uneven so you need such tools right uh there's one last question um how to calculate volume for active sites in the homology model without the ligand is there an option in site map yes you just need to open the site map and run it it will give you all those parameters like size volume other parameters it's all there thank you dr prajwal for answering those questions and for your presentation i think it was very popular since we received so many questions 
Uh, we are just in time for the second presentation of the day. Uh, so the second presentation is a molecular dynamic simulation theory and analysis by Dr. Koshik. Um, yes, so I'll just pass over the controls to you. I can see your screen. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Shelvia, and thank you very much to all of the participants. And over to you, Dr. Kaushik. Uh, thanks, Prashwan. Well, thanks, Shelvia. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'll be talking about molecular dynamic simulations and how you can apply molecular dynamics in drug discovery. Um, if you have any questions, continue to post your questions in the YouTube chat, and we'll get back to the questions after we finish the talk. Uh, all right, let's get started. So why do you need to do molecular dynamics? Last week, we looked at so many different concepts of docking. Uh, we, uh, our goal is to study how the drug interacts with the receptor. So here I have uh, a receptor, you have a ligand and you want to study how this ligand interacts with the receptor and how do you stop the activity of a protein by using a ligand. And for that purpose, last week we looked at so many different topics from uh, introduction to computer drug design, uh, where we looked at structure-based drug design methods. We looked at ligand-based, we just introduced ligand-based drug design methods. We'll go into details of ligand-based drug design methods tomorrow. Um, and uh, we also looked at uh, target structure understanding. Uh, how do you select a structure from X-ray? How do you select a structure using NMR or if the structure is inhibitor bound? We looked at all of these things last week. We also looked at ligand library for simulation uh, where we looked at different databases that you can use to prepare your ligands. We have Zinc databases, we have PubChem, we have other databases that you can use. Um, and so you have all of these options. Um, and we also looked at protein preparation and ligand preparation for simulation, uh, for docking, not for simulation, where if you have missing residues in your protein, how do you fix the residues? Uh, how do you generate different uh, tautomers for ligands? How do you generate different protein states for your protein? We looked at all of those things last week. And after that, we also tried to identify ligand binding sites using sitemap. All of these were covered last week. We also covered the theory of principles and methods of molecular docking using Glide. We looked at high throughput virtual screening, HTVS. We also looked at docking using single precision mode. We also looked at docking using extra precision mode. We saw all of these things. And we also had a session on virtual screening uh, and how do you prioritize the molecules? How do you identify a hit molecule? How do you identify a lead molecule? Uh, we looked at all of these things. And finally, we also had a session on flexible docking and colon docking. Uh, where we looked at induced docking and also a tool called colon docking. So after last week's sessions and also with today's session on homology modeling in the morning, uh, probably all of you are confident of doing how to do docking. So if you know how to do docking, then why do you need to do molecular dynamics? Well, docking, when you do docking, if you see this particular video here, uh, if you look at this, the protein is, is fixed and you only change the ligand. However, in reality, everything is moving. We are moving the, uh, when we are moving, the proteins in our body are working and they're working to work, they have to move and the ligands have to move. They have to go through the different parts of the body to go to the, the binding pocket. And so you, everything is moving all the time. And so if you have a rigid receptor like here, it's not an accurate representation of what is happening in our body at all times. And for that reason, you always have to include some sort of dynamics in your, in your calculations. And since docking does not do it, last week we also covered induced fit docking. So just to recap again, docking is, is uh, very simple. The protein is rigid, only the ligand is moving. And because of this particular, uh, because the protein is not moving, the calculations are really fast, they are really quick, and it's very, very cheap to do the calculations. So if you have like, one lakh compounds, you can do docking and you can get your answer in one or two days for those one lakh compounds. It's also very easy to score it because the protein is not moving. So all of these calculations are really fast. But, but after you dock, do docking, let's say you have like 100 molecules or 10 molecules that you finalize that are really good ones. And for those ones, you can try to do induced fit docking. In induced fit docking, you have uh, 
the binding pocket is flexible only the binding pocket the protein is not flexible and the ligand is also flexible and because the binding pocket is not is flexible the calculations are slow um and it's computationally expensive compared to docking and you also have different confirmations of ligands and binding sites which are being explored in industry docking however even after you do industry docking the binding pocket might be flexible but in reality the whole protein is always flexible and for that reason you always want to go for molecular dynamic simulations as an end step for your molecular docking process in molecular dynamic simulations the whole protein is flexible the ligand is also flexible and because all of these atoms are flexible and all of these atoms are moving the calculations are very slow and it's very very expensive to do it computationally um and you will have to explore different confirmations of ligands and proteins so you have to do all of these things for that reason molecular dynamic simulations are the last step that you usually do when you're doing when you're trying to identify a ligand molecule to dock to interact with your protein so just to recap docking is fast and uh, simple induced fit docking is has slightly more flexibility it's completely slightly more expensive but md simulations are the gold standard for evaluating your your ligand poses so just to add to that uh, what you can do in md simulations is that you can try to understand the stability of a drug binding in docking you know that the ligand interacts with the protein but you don't know how well the ligand interacts with the protein so for example if you look at this video if it's a md simulation of a protein which is shown as a surface representation in white gray color and the ligand is shown in orange here and the ligand is interacting with the protein and you can see that in this particular video if this ligand is present in the binding pocket it is not leaving the binding pocket then it indicates that the drug is stable and because it is a really uh, expensive method you only want to do md simulations for like 10 ligands or 20 ligands you don't want to do it for 1 lakh compounds and so you have to initially get your number of molecules from 1 lakh to uh, 10 or 20 using docking or induced fit docking and after you have those two uh, narrow it down to 10 20 molecules then you can do md simulations and uh, md simulations also useful for uh, identifying ligands uh, with similar docking scores so you can differentiate between ligands that has similar docking scores so let's say you do docking using uh, glide and then you get like four different uh, ligands that have similar binding scores like minus 11 to minus 10 you don't know which one of these is is the best one they are all in the same range uh glide is going to tell you that it's minus 11 is the best one but you can only be confident of your answer only after you do multiple dynamic simulations and when you do the multiple dynamic simulations you can identify which of the ligands is actually stable in here because the protein is moving the ligand is moving the interactions might change between the protein and the ligand and so all of those these these scores that you see of minus 11 minus 10 are refined by better uh picture of what is happening in reality and so it can md simulations can be used to differentiate between the ligands that have similar scores and so that's why you always have to do md simulations after you do docking uh, it's always recommended and if you want to get your paper published then they always recommend you to do md simulations for your final docking poses so the next question is how does md simulations work the basic idea is very simple uh, uh, what you have to do is you have to somehow find a way to move the atoms so you have to move the atoms in the protein you have to move the atoms in the ligand and you have to do them simultaneously so you have you can study the interactions as a function of time and uh, so let's just see how the basics of md uh, simulation works let's take a hypothetical molecule so here i have a simple molecule uh, the same concepts apply for a bigger molecule like a protein the same concepts apply for dna rna the same concepts for apply even if you have a membrane uh, bound protein so let's just look at the same the simple molecule and try to understand how molecular dynamics works for the simple molecule so if you look at this molecule it has seven carbons 1 2 3 4 5 6 and 7 it also has two oxygens here it's a carboxyl group here and you also have a nh3 plus atom here so you have all of these uh, uh, atoms present in this molecule and when you try to do md simulations you first need to identify all the interactions that are present in this particular molecule so for example if you look at this particular molecule you have a bond between atoms 2 and 3 
You also have a bond between atoms one and two. You have a bond between three and four, four and five, five and seven, five and six, seven and oxygen, this one, seven and oxygen minus, three and nitrogen here. So all of these bonds are, uh, for all of these bonds, you have a simple equation, which looks like this. You don't have to memorize these equations. All of these things are taken care of the software. I'm just introducing the concepts here so that you're aware of it. So you have all of these bonds, which are like uh, six of them, plus two, plus one, nine total bonds. And so for, for each of these bonds, you have different parameters that you can have. All of these things are already built into the software. You don't have to worry about it. You just use this and you try to uh, check this, uh, calculate the bond energy for each of these bonds. Once you find the bond energies, the next thing that you have to calculate is the angles. So angles are defined for every three atoms. And so you have an angle between one, two, and three. You have an angle between two, three, and four, three, four, and five, and so on. And you get the basic gist of it. And so for all of these angles, you also calculate the energy for each of these angles. And the calculation is based on this equation. Again, you don't have to memorize it. It's good to be aware of it. Um, and you don't need to know it uh, if you have to do simulations. And the next thing that you can also, that is also being calculated is if you have four atoms, like you have one, two, three, and four. And so here I have a simple molecule, butane. And if you remember from your intermediate chemistry, uh, you remember that uh, butane has different conformations. You can have a trans conformation, you can have a cis conformation. The cis conformation is less stable compared to the trans conformation. And for modeling this type of interactions where one conformation is more stable than the other conformation, you also have a term called dihedrals. And there's the formula for calculating the dihedral energy. And you don't have to memorize this thing again. And these things are taking care of the software. I'm just introducing concepts here again. And so it's not just done for these four atoms. You also do it for two, three, four, five. You do it for three, four, five, six. You do it for all of these atoms that have an interaction like nitrogen, three, four, and five, three, four, five, and seven. You can do all of these calculations. But if you look at this particular molecule here, you also have a few interactions that are non-bonded. So for example, there is no bond between nitrogen and oxygen here. And you also have to estimate the interaction between nitrogen and oxygen. So how do you do that? So for calculating non bond interactions, there are two different terms. One is called electrostatic. It's a simple equation that you learned in your intermediate physics where you have the charge of nitrogen, the charge of oxygen, and you divide, multiply the two charges and divide it by the distance. Uh, sorry, this should be Rij, not Rij square. Uh, so, you calculate the energy, electrostatic energy here. And you can also have this Lennard-Jones interactions, which prevent the two atoms from coming very close to each other uh, to avoid steady clashes. So you have all of these uh, equations that are there. So we looked at uh, these three, and then we looked at these two here. And all of these e interactions, you calculate for every pair of atoms in your protein, every possible setup that you have. If you have bonded interactions, you calculate the bonded energies you have angle, then you calculate all the angles. If you have dihedral, you calculate all the dihedrals. You also calculate all the charge-charge interactions. You also calculate all the Leonard-Jones interactions. And once you calculate all of these interactions, then you have this master equation. And this whole equation is together called a force field. Again, let me emphasize this. You don't have to know all of these equations. You just have to know that all of these things contribute to the force field. And there are so many different force fields that are available right now. And Strodinger uses OPLS3E. The advantage of using OPLS3E is that it's not just that you have these parameters, these equations for the protein or for the DNA or for the RNA. It also has parameters for 95% of the chemical space, which includes all the likeness that you can think of, uh, most of the likeness that you can think of, uh, all the DNA, all the protein, all the different uh, nucleotides, different amino acids. You can also think of uh, modified amino acids like phosphorylated amino acids, it has the parameters for all of these different atoms and residues and molecules. And because you have all of these parameters in one single force field, it's very easy to identify the interaction between, uh, let's say a protein and a ligand or DNA and protein or protein and RNA. You can do all of these interactions, study all of these interactions. All of these are pre-calculated. You don't have to worry about any of these things. They're all fit into the software. All you have to do is just use the software and do the calculations. So once you know how the forces are being calculated for each of these atoms, once you know like how to do the bequeeping, how many bonds are there, how many angles are there, how many dihedrals are there, how many charge interactions are there, how many Lennard-Jones interactions are there, 
The next thing that you have to do is you have to calculate the force acting on each atom that is present in your system. For example, here I have three atoms instead of the nine atoms that I had before. Uh, so you have atom one, atom two, atom three. For each of these atoms, you calculate the force coming from atom two, atom three, and you calculate all the forces on atom one here. So it's just simple, basic intermediate algebra, vector algebra, so you can do all of these calculations. Um, and once you have the forces, you calculate the acceleration just by dividing the force with the mass. This is the same equation that you looked at so many times when you're doing an in intermediate, F equal to MA, we just rearrange this to be A equal to F or M. And this acceleration is for each atom, this force is for each atom, this mass is, is for the same particular atom. So once you calculate the acceleration, from the force, the next thing is if you know acceleration, then you can calculate velocity uh, by using this equation where acceleration is equal to velocity over time. And once you have the velocity, you can calculate the position of the atom uh, by using this equation. If you know velocity, you can just use this equation R over T and you multiply the velocity with the time, you get the position of the atom. So why do we have to do this? Because in molecular dynamics, you want to move these atoms from one place to the second place. For example, here you have the black atoms, which is the initial position here in black. And the same atom is moved to this gray position here. So atom one moves to the gray area here. Atom two moves to the gray area here. Atom three moves to the gray area here. So all of these things have to be moved. And to move them, again, let me just repeat this. You first have to find the forces using the force field. Then you calculate the acceleration. And once you have the acceleration, you have the velocity. And once you have the velocity, you can have the positions. And you just have to calculate this. So if you look at this particular set of equations here, you don't have to memorize anything. It's just very simple here. All you're trying to do is R of T, which indicates the position of, let's say, atom two at time T. You just say, what is the position going to be after a time step of delta T? And delta T indicates a time difference. So I have the black circle here at time T, and I have the gray circle here at time T plus delta T. And R is just like a combination of the change in X direction, the change in Y direction, the change in Z direction. And you just add these smoothest atoms for a small time step. And a time step is typically one to five frames per seconds, depending on your uh, different ways of calculating it. You don't have to worry about any of these things. You just have to, it's good to be aware of them. You don't have to memorize it. The software does all of these calculations in, in the background. Um, the only thing that you have to worry about is how many times do you have to run this calculation? So if you have one frame per second, then if you want to do one picosecond calculation simulations, then you have to do this, repeat this calculation thousand times. If you have to run it for one nanosecond, then you have to repeat this calculation a million times, like that is 10 lakh times. And if you want to do this calculation for a microsecond, then you have to do it for 100 crore uh, times. And because you have to do it for 10 lakh times, 100 crore times, this method is computationally very expensive compared to the other methods. And so it, again, you don't have to worry about uh, uh, how long it takes, like for the study that you're trying to do right now, if you just want to identify how long it takes for uh, uh, to, to know if your ligand is having a stable interaction with your protein, uh, you can just do the calculation for a few nanoseconds, like. Uh, 50 nanoseconds, that's sufficient. And depending on, if you look at this chart, there are different things that you can study in different time scales. If you want to look at the bond vibrations, that is each individual bond length, then you have to do the stimulation for a few frames per seconds. If you want to look at side chain uh, rotamers, then you have to do the calculation for a few picoseconds um, to nanoseconds. And if you want to look at large scale loop motion where your loop is changing, then you have to do the calculation for a few nanoseconds to a few microseconds. Um, and if you want to look at ligand binding and unbinding, that is, you don't know where the ligand is, you have the ligand in, in, in outside the protein, and if you want to understand how the ligand goes into the protein, then you have to do the calculation for microseconds to milliseconds. But in your case, you already know that the ligand is docked inside the protein, and all you're trying to do is try to under, understand the stability of the ligand of the protein. And for that, you can all you have to do is do simulations for 50 nanoseconds or 100 nanoseconds, and it might... Think, you might think that you know if you have to do it for 15 nanoseconds, then you have to do the calculation 50 lakh times, which is a lot of times. But with GPUs these days, you can easily do calculations of 100 nanoseconds per day on a standard size protein. 
So if you have to do for 50 nanoseconds, then all you need to do is you have one GPU and you can do the simulation for half a day and you'll get, you can identify if your ligand is, has a stable interaction with the protein or not. So it is really easy to do this. So just to recap, all you have to do is, you know, use the software. The software is going to calculate the forces for you in your protein and ligand. It's also going to move the atoms for you. And all you have to do is just tell the software how long you have to do the calculation for. So let's look at how you can use Strodinger to do the MD simulations. Uh, you can use different softwares to do it, but using Strodinger, it's very, very easy to do the calculations for, to set the MD simulations. Uh, you first have to uh, get your protein from the PDB. Uh, and once you have your protein, uh, you use the protein preparation wizard, which we looked at last week. Uh, and we are also going to have demo sessions next week on how to do these calculations. And you just start to make sure that your protein is complete. It has all the hydrogens. It has every missing residue is covered. You don't have any missing residues in your loop. Uh, the side chains are in optimal position. You prepare your protein. Once you prepare your protein, you have to build a system for doing the simulations. And it is easy to do it. I'll go into details in the next few slides. Uh, you can set up your membrane. If you have a membrane, you can set up your water if you have water. Um, and you can set up, I can add ions to your system. You can do all of these things in system builder. And once you do the system building, then you go to MD simulation, where you do the simulation um, here and you have the protein moving, you have the ligand moving, you can study the interaction between the two of them. And once you do the simulation, you can analyze your simulation and all of these things are single clicks. It's very easy to do it using Strodinger. I'll just show them in a few slides, in the next few slides, how easy it is, to, it is to do the simulation and also how easy it is to do the analysis of the simulation. And this is just a brief workflow of how you can do MD simulation in here. So let's just look at how to do the system builder uh, in the next slide. So Desmond is the molecular package for doing the MD simulations in Strodinger. It is the fastest MD engine compared to other softwares. So Amber, Gromax are slower compared to Desmond. And it's, if you look at this particular interface, it's all MOS clicks. You don't have to do any, any commands. You don't have to type any, uh, any commands. It's just, you just click on different things. It's very easy to build your system. And if you look at this particular uh, image here, I have the protein, which I'm showing you in cartoon representation here. There's a ligand, which is not so clearly visible. Uh, you have these red dots here. These red dots are all water molecules. Why do you need to have water molecules? You need to have water molecules because most of our body is 70% water. So you have to be as close to reality as possible. So you want to have all of that water. So it's indicated here in a box. And you can also add ions. So it's very easy to build it. All you have to do is just click on these different options that you have. Uh, for example, if you want to choose different water models, you have different water models here. You have SPC, T3P, T4P. You also have octanol or methanol if you want to have co-solvents in your uh, system. You can add all of these things. It's very easy to choose it. All you have to do is just click on this box here and just drop down and look at these different options that you have. And once you select your water model, uh, you can also use water models outside these things with external scripts, which you don't have to worry about. It's just easy to use this, these options here. TIP3P is a good model to start with. You can also use TIP4P EW um, and you, you just need, you can use any one of these water models for you to have a decent uh, simulation. Once you select the water model, the next thing that you have to do is you define uh, what type of box you want. Do you want a box that is cube-like? Do you want a box that is different shaped? Uh, you can set your box dimensions here. You can set a buffer. You can do all of these things. It's all most clicks. It's very easy to set up. And it's also very easy to choose the box dimensions. Once you do both of these things, you can also set up a membrane. If you have a membrane protein like GPCR, which is transmembrane protein, for example, all you have to do is just click on this option here and you can set up different types of membranes like POPC uh, or different membranes. If you look at this image here, this is water. You have a protein here and you have a membrane in gray, which is shown here. You can set up all of these things with just simple MOS clicks. And once you set up your membrane, if you have a membrane from protein, uh, then you can also add ions to your system. It's very easy to add ions. It automatically adds ions uh, depending on the charge of your protein. Um, you have all of these options to add salt as well. So all of these things are most clicks. You don't have to worry about uh, setting up through command line. It's just very easy to use it. Click, click, click. And like with three or four clicks, you can set up your whole system. 
And once you set up your system, the next thing you have to do is you have to start the simulation. And to start the simulation, there are a few things that you have to consider. It's again, very, very easy to start the simulation using Stodinger. Uh, the first thing you have to do is you have to load your molecule um, that is there. So here you can see that, you know, it tells you how many number of atoms you have in your system. You have to move all of those atoms. You have to identify how long you have to move the atoms for. So you can move them for 10 nanoseconds or you can move them for 100 nanoseconds. You can move them for a few picoseconds too, depending on what you're trying to study. Um, and setting time is just like, you just have to enter your time. It just does a calculation here automatically. So it's very easy to do that. And once you set up your uh, time, the next thing you have to do is choose an ensemble. Again, these are all different options that are there. You don't have to worry about these different options. Just use the default options and you're uh, good to go. But if you want to have more control, you can you have these different ensembles that are supported. You have a NVE ensemble, which is normal volume and energy. Um, NVT ensemble is normal volume and temperature. NPT is normal pressure and temperature. Uh, these two options are useful if you have a protein in uh, solvent and ligand in solvent. Uh, if you have a membrane protein, then you might want to use NPAT, A stands for area, or NP gamma T, where gamma stands for surface tension. If you have membranes, then you want to use these two ensembles. If you have, if you do not have a membrane, then you can just use these two. And all of these things are default options. Uh, just use NPT uh, and you are good to go. So once you do that, you also have a few advanced options where you can choose a thermostat or a barostat. Why do you want to have different temperatures? Well, most of us exist at uh, the human body is usually at uh, 298 Kelvin or 300 Kelvin, or uh, 30 centigrade centigrade, uh, and uh, that's a normal temperature. Uh, but there are some bacteria that exist at uh, really high temperatures, like 80 degrees centigrade. You can try to set the temperature using these advanced options. You can also try to choose different thermostat and barostat, uh, like Nozohover thermostat or Langevin thermostat. There are different options that you can choose. You don't have to know any of these things. Uh, the default options work well, and it's just for people who want to be aware of these different options that you have that I'm telling you these options. So just to recap, we looked at how to build a system, how to add ions, how to add water, how to add membrane and how to choose that time that you want another simulation for, which ensemble that you want to use, and how do you do different, uh, uh, set up different thermostats or barostats and all of these options. So once you start your simulation, the next thing you have to do is you have to look at the trajectory. So here I have the protein, I have a ligand here, I have this different water molecules here that is shown here. And you can see that in this particular video, all of these atoms are moving, the protein is moving, the ligand is moving, the water molecules are moving. And here I just remove the water molecules. You can look at this particular interaction of the ligand with the protein. You can also like zoom into the interactions. You can look at exactly what is happening to the ligand and how it is interacting with the protein. You can see this ligand atoms moving here. You can see the dashed yellow lines, which indicate the interaction with the protein. We have all of these things that you can look at. You can zoom out a bit. You can look at the interactions between the ligand and the amino acids here in more detail. See here, you can see the interaction with, with, with leucine, lysine, you can when the ligand, you can see all of these interactions. And so all of these things can be done using a MD simulation. Just to show you the video again. So you start with your uh, protein and ligand in a water box, you do your simulation. And as simulation is proceeding, you can look at the different interactions between the ligand and the protein. Um, and so you can also see so many different things here. It's just so much more convenient to look at all these interactions between the ligand and the protein and understand how stable each of these interactions is. Now, when you're trying to look at the interactions like this, it's very difficult for you to identify what interactions are happening. It's moving so fast. I can't really identify any of the interactions. I don't know which one is stable. I see these lines forming and disappearing. I have no idea what is happening here. So how can, is there a better way to look at these interactions? Can I be more confident on what are the most stable interactions? Um, how is the protein interacting with the ligand? Can I do more analysis? So just to do that, there is a separate tool in Studinger, which is called the simulation interaction diagram. It's very easy to do the analysis. Uh, all you have to do is just select all of these boxes, uh, click select all, and then you click run. It's going to do the analysis. It takes around five minutes to do the analysis. And after you do the analysis, you can just look at your results. So what do you want to look at? Uh, we already did docking in the previous sessions. We know how docking works. We know that the ligand is interacting with the protein. What we want to do is we want to look at the ligand stability. 
So if you look at this particular video here, you have the protein and you have the ligand and the ligand is interacting with the protein and you want to look at how stable the ligand is. And so one way to understand how stable the ligand is, is to look at uh, RMST plots. Uh, the RMST tells you how much the ligand is moving from its initial position and how much is the protein deviating from its initial position. So if you look at this particular graph here, you have on the x-axis, you have time for, we did the simulation of five nanoseconds. And on the y-axis, you have RMST. Um, in blue, you have the protein RMST. The protein is moving. Uh, you can see that the RMST is changing through the as simulation is going on, which indicates that the protein is moving. And if you look at the red one, which is the ligand RMST, you can see that the ligand RMST is less than two angstrom for the entirety of the simulation. This indicates that the ligand is stable inside the binding pocket of the protein. So you did your docking, you turn to the simulation and the ligand is not leaving the binding pocket. This indicates that it's a strong interaction with the protein. And it's a good inhibitor for the protein for what are you trying to inhibit or what are you trying to study using the ligand. And you can also like, you know, you can look at the stability of your ligand with the protein, or you can also look at the individual interactions, like what exactly is happening in this between the ligand and the protein. And if you want to look at this individual interactions, it's very difficult to look at it in a video form here. So there are tools that are there. And again, just using the simulation interaction diagram, which we looked at before, you can understand the individual interactions. So you can get like really clear plots, like the one that is shown here, where there are two different plots. I will tell you each one individually. In the bottom plot here, what you have on the y-axis is the amino acids on the protein, on the receptor. On the x-axis, you have time. And the color indicates the number of contacts you have between the amino acid and the ligand. For example, if you have a darker color red, then it indicates that the this particular amino acid has a uh, very like has a higher number of contacts with the ligand. Like for example, it has more than four contacts with the ligand or three or four contacts with the ligand here. And these ones, these amino acids have contacts forming. And then you see that it's a white region here, which means that the contact is disappearing. And so it has, it forms and it, it doesn't form. So it indicates that this particular amino acid might not be important for the stability of the ligand. And for example, if you look at these amino acids here, these are completely white, which indicates that these amino acids do not interact with the ligand at all. And so you can look at all of these uh, contacts between the ligand and the protein in a clear graph representation. You can also look at it in terms of the type of interaction that is forming here. So there are different colors here for each amino acid. The x-axis indicates the different amino acids in the protein. The y-axis indicates the fraction of contacts that you have with the ligand for each of these amino acids. The color code is like for if it's green, then you have it's a hydrogen bond interaction. If it is uh, blue, then it's a water bridge. If it is uh, red, which is not shown here, it's an ionic interaction. If it is purple, it's a hydrophobic interaction. You have all of these interactions that you can study between the protein and the ligand using this particular uh, diagrams here. All these plots are generated automatically for you. Uh, and it might be a bit difficult for you to uh, interpret this. Uh, you can also have a ligand interaction diagram, which is automatically generated for you, where you might have looked at this from the presentations last week, where this one tells you the interaction between the ligand and the amino acids on the protein that you have. And how, so when you use this ligand interaction diagram for a simulation, it all, not only tells you what interactions you have between the the amino acid and the protein uh, and, and the ligand, it also tells you how long the interaction is present for. For example, if you look at the interaction between this NH group and this glutamate, it tells you that this interaction is present for 100% of the simulation, or this interaction is present for 90% of the simulation. So you have these analysis that you can use to do your, after you do your simulation, which tells you if your ligand is sta stable with the protein and why is it stable. And so if you have like four or five different ligands, you can understand like, why a particular ligand is more stable compared to other ligand just by looking at these diagrams here. And so it tells you like, you know, if you have like four or five different ligands with a similar score, you can identify why one particular ligand is more stable than the other one just by looking at these diagrams. And this is from a ligand perspective. So you can look at the interaction between ligand and protein from ligand perspective. Uh, you can also look at the protein fluctuations. So if you have a pro part of the protein that is interacting with the ligand, then those parts will be moving less compared to the rest of the protein. Uh, and so you can measure those particular uh, uh, fluctuations too. So if 
if a, a particular amino acid in the protein has interaction with the ligand, it's going to move less. So if you look at this particular plot here, you have the residues on the protein on the x-axis and you have the fluctuations on the y-axis. And if you look at this particular plot, you have high fluctuations here, you have low fluctuations for some of them, and you have high fluctuations, low fluctuations, and all of these is changing for each amino acid. And if you look at this particular plot here, if you look at these particular green lines here, this indicates that these particular amino acids are interacting with the ligand. And you can see that the ones that interact with the ligand have lower fluctuations compared to the ones that do not interact with the ligand. So this tells you like which uh, part of the protein is interacting with the ligand. So you can try to modify your protein if you want to, if you know what you're trying to do, or you can try to modify your ligand change the functional groups to understand why certain amino acids are interacting with the ligand and why certain other amino acids are not interacting with the ligand. So you can do all of these analysis. And these are just some of them. There are like a lot more, many more analysis that you can do here. Uh, you can also study how a, a ligand goes into the protein and leaves the protein binding and binding. You can do all of those studies. Uh, you can, there are other methods of molecular dynamics that you can use like metadynamics or replication molecular dynamics, or you can also use free energy perturbation. There are these different methods that are available for you where, which you can use to calculate your uh, simulations in a faster way, in a better way, in a more accurate way. So all of these options are there. I'm not going to details of these things. It's just good to be aware of that there are some options that you can use. And uh, lastly, I would like to thank the team that uh, all of us are here. Uh, so this is our entire team. And uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. And if I'm not able to any answer any other questions, you can always email me the questions at kaushikasprinja.com or you can always call me on my mobile number that is shown here. And I'll be happy to take any questions uh, that are there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Koshri, for that uh, wonderful presentation. We have received a lot of questions. Um, so I'm just going to, okay. Um, so we have received a lot of questions and a lot of them have come uh, from this particular part of your presentation when you were talking about the the solvent models and the water model. So okay. um, I'm just going to put all those questions together and ask you. Um, so the first question is um, like they want you to elaborate a little bit about the solvent models and also like what uh, would be like, how do you choose like different solvent models, the water models? Why did you use a uh, tip 3p water why did you show that and is there somewhere they can read up about it uh, about the different solvent models in schrodinger yes uh, sure so let's break this down so there are different water models and the reason why there are different water models is because of two things one is how long does it take to compute the interactions and two is when was the water model developed so the if you look at the different water models, some of them are three-point water models, some of them are four-point water models, some of them are five-point water models. So a point indicates the number of uh, point, atoms that you might have in your system. So for a three-point water model, we have the oxygen, hydrogen, and hydrogen, which is what you would expect for a water model. But if you also think of a, a water model, the oxygen has two lone pairs. And there are different ways of trying to account for the lone pairs. And that's why you have different water models like four point water models or five point water models. Um, and uh, the more the number of points that you have, the more the number of calculations that you have to do. So three point water model will have like probably two or three calculations. A four point water model will have an extra calculation that you have to do. And it's not just for one water molecule, you have to do the calculation, extra calculation for all the water molecules in your system. And because you have to do the calculation for all the water molecules, the extra calculation, it's going to be computationally more expensive. So again, it always comes down to how much computing power you have and what is the speed that you get with each water model. A three-point water model like SPC or T3P is the fastest. And a four-point water model is going to be slower than a T in a three-point water model. A five-point water model is going to be slower than a four-point water model. So you have to take these things into account when you're trying to do the simulation. In most cases, a three-point water model or a four-point water model are sufficient and they are accurate. Um, SPC was one of the first water models that you had, and TPP came after SPC, so it has better properties uh, compared to SPC. 
tip 4p models are even newer compared to tip 3p models and so they are more accurate but you also again have to think that the four point water model is going to have an extra calculation and uh, it's going to be computationally expensive uh, there are new water models like opc uh, and so there are different things that you have so it always is a it's a uh, decision that you have to take depending on uh, which water model is accurate tip 3p is the best one or spce not spc spc with an extended water model is, is the best one uh, that you can use and so there are different choices that you have to make and if you want to get more details on water models uh, you can uh, look at wikipedia wikipedia has a lot of information you can just google all the water models and you have all of this information that are there and uh, tip 3p or tip 4p ew are good water models that you can use for your calculations Right. Uh, there's another question. Um, so, is there a particular water model that is compatible with OPLS three? Yes, uh, tip three P or SPC are compatible with them. Uh, you'll have to uh, look at the research papers. I can get back to you in detail as to which one is the best compatible one. But tip three P and tip four P should work perfectly well with OPLS three. Uh, all the water models are very well parameterized in OPLS three. Thanks, Pitesh. Right. Uh, so I think we covered all those questions. Um, since there were so many repetitions, so I thought maybe we can cover them all together. Uh, so the next question is, uh, why do you take one to five femtoseconds time step usually? Why is it preferred? So the reason why you have to take a small time step, like you can probably try 10 frames per second, but it's not recommended and it's not ideal either. The reason being that if you look at the CH bond frequency, the carbon hydrogen bond frequency, uh, it has a particular frequency for that, like tempo minus 14 or minus 15. And so you, if you have a time step bigger than one, two frames per second, or even five frames per second, then what would happen is if you try to move your atoms by the time you move your hydrogen and carbon atoms, the hydrogen and carbon bond will be broken if you take a bigger time step. And so you have to restrict it to one to two, four or five frames per second because you want to keep the hydrogen attached to the carbon and the CH bond frequency is, is of the order of a few uh, 10 femtoseconds per seconds or 20 femtoseconds. per seconds. And you want to have your time step below that value. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is, I think you mentioned something like uh, you can run up to 100 nanoseconds a day. So on what hardware uh, are you giving those figures? Uh, these are on uh, regular gaming cards like GPUs, like these numbers are applicable for uh, any of the GTX series. Uh, the P100s or the V100s have even faster time numbers. So these are just standard GPU cards that you can get. Uh, that you use to run your computer games or any of those things. And these numbers are available. Uh, you can look at the Stranger website to find out the timings for each of the different GPUs that are there. Uh, just look at the website and you'll get to know like what GPU will give you how much speed and what is the number of atoms that you have in your system. It is all parameterized, it's all benchmarked. You can just look at the table that is available on the website. Thank you. Um, so the table is available at schrodinger.com slash desmond. So you can just go to that page and there is a nice graph there that you can look at. Um, so the next question is about the hardware requirements. I think we got a few questions. Um, so the hardware, uh, you require a Linux and a GPU card that is supported by Schrodinger. Um, if you go to schrodinger.com slash supported platforms, uh, I will also put these link uh, in my announcements later. So you can just look at that to get more info on the hardware part. Uh, so um, Dr. Kaushik, there is a, a comment sort of a thing. Um, mm -hmm. So the person says, I think we need to work in reverse first. We need to do the molecular dynamics followed by IFD, then the molecular docking. Uh, like because when we go for MD, uh, there is a lot of like crucial ligands that basically we take them out after the MD. So what do you think? Like, is that the right way? Is that a way? It, it depends on the number of ligands that you have. If you have uh, thousands of ligands, 
then you should never do MD synthesis for thousands of ligands because you're just wasting a lot of computing power. In those cases, you always have to do docking first to narrow down. And docking is, is good enough. It's not perfect, it's good enough. And you have to reduce it to like 20 or 30 compounds. And when you have that, you can, you can go for MD simulations. If you directly started MD simulations before doing docking, I mean, if you have 10 ligands, yes, maybe you can do it. But if you already do MD simulations, then you don't have to do docking after that. Uh, MD simulation is good enough for you to understand if your uh, ligand is interacting with the protein or not. And you can also do MMG basic calculations to identify an accurate binding energy for your molecule. So if you're doing MD simulations first, I don't think you should do docking after that. Docking should always be before MD simulations. Um, yeah, I wouldn't really do it in reverse order. I would always do it in from docking and then you go for MD. You don't have to do IFT either. You can go from docking to MD directly uh, if you have the computing power and if your number of ligands are 10 or 20, not more. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is, why is it necessary for MD systems to be neutral? Uh, that's a good question. And uh, the answer is not simple. Uh, the reason that you have to keep the system neutral is because of periodic boundary conditions. And uh, so think of this, like, uh, and when you do an experiment, the protein is mostly in a neutral environment. And uh, they make it neutral by adding salt, uh, so that it tries to keep it neutral. But if you have an ion in an MD simulation, then that ion is going to be replicated in the periodic images. And because you have the ion being replicated in periodic images, then, uh, uh, so let's say you have like one ion or two ions, then it's a plus two or, plus or minus two charge, then that minus two charge is replicated in all the images. And so your overall system will have a really high positive charge or really high negative charge. There are ways to overcome this. So the most methods right now use particle mesh evolved to account for uh, the uh, effects of long range interactions for, because of the charge. And if you have a big box, like uh, a buffer of uh, 12 angstrom or 13 or 14 angstrom, 15 angstrom from your protein or ligand atoms, then PME accounts for most of those, uh, those uh, net charge. And so it's not necessary for you to have a neutral molecule, but it's recommended to have a neutral molecule if you are going to have a smaller box and if you're not using PME. Uh, but I think most cases like these days, uh, you can get away with it, but it's recommended to have a neutral system. Um, and the best way to neutral a system is by adding salt. If you're adding ions, then you should also add salt. Otherwise you have a net charge that is duplicated across all your periodic bond images. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kaushik. I think you answered the next question also. Um, so the question is when, we, when do we need to add salt and when we can avoid this? Uh, just to add on that point, uh, you always want to replicate your MD simulation to be as close to the experiment. And if when you do, when you look at the paper that they did experiment, uh, experimental studies on in them, and if they use salt when, when they did the calculation, then you have to use salt in your simulation as well. So it's not just about neutralizing your system, it's also about trying to be as close to the experimental as possible. So always read the paper, always try to see what has been done before. And if there is no information on that, then you might, you don't have to add a salt, but if the experiment uses salt, then you have to use a salt. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is, what is the optimal simulation time recording interval and the number of frames? Um, so the number of frames, so the simulation time interval, ideally you want to, depends on what you want to study. Um, so if you want to study just the stability of the ligand, like 50 nanoseconds is sufficient to do the calculation. But if you want to study ligand binding and unbinding where it goes into the binding pocket, goes out of the binding pocket, then you have to do a calculation for microseconds. And uh, again, you know, the number of frames that you want to have is also dependent on what you're trying to study. For example, if you are looking at uh, stability of the ligand, then you don't have to, then you have to save your, uh, your uh, frames often like every 10 picoseconds or 20 picoseconds. Um, but if you are trying to do a calculation for ligand unbinding and binding, then the motions happen on a longer time scale, like microseconds. So you can save your simulations every 100 picoseconds or uh, 200 picoseconds, but it's recommended to save your frames 
uh, less at least every 100 picoseconds or even 20 picoseconds because you can, if you have more number of frames you can always like skip the frames when you're doing analysis if you have less number of frames you can ever add frames to it so you always want to have as many frames as possible but a good number is 10 picoseconds or 20 picoseconds is a good number to save your frames and the simulation timeline is always dependent on what you're trying to study Thank you. Uh, so moving on to the next question, um, how do we choose between different ensemble classes? So uh, the ensemble classes are, so I mentioned you four, five different ensembles, but you mostly will be dealing with NVT or NPT. If you have membrane, then you have NPAT or NP gamma T. So you only use those ones if you have a membrane, those the last two ones, but NVT and NPT, you can use either one of them. NPT is always recommended because NPT is close to what the experiment does. When people do experiments, they have, they do the calculation at atmospheric pressure and at 300 Kelvin, you can change your pressure, you can change your temperature, but it's recommended to use the default values. And because the experiment always does it at one bar and 300 Kelvin, you want to be close to experiment and you want to use NPT. But uh, you can use NVT or NPT. Uh, it's not going to be a big difference. Uh, yeah, you can use either one of them. But NPT is better. Because you can directly get Gibbs free energy from an NPT ensemble. Right. Um, so the next question is, um, is it possible Okay, if, uh, yeah, is it possible to run MD on a simple ligand molecule to see the interaction between the surrounding water? And is it possible to change the solvent as well? Yes, yes, you can do just a simple ligand in, uh, in a water box. Uh, you can also do a simple ligand in uh, different solvents too, uh, like urea or octanol or methanol. You can use any other solvent that you want to use. Uh, you can do all of those things and uh, it's possible with Stodinger and also other softwares too. Right, the next question is, um, how much R RMSD deviation is permitted? Uh, do we need to consider the mean RMSD or the individual point RMSD? Uh, so your RMSD should ideally be less than two angstrom um, from your initial structure or from the native structure or extra structure. You can probably go to maybe 2.5 to 3 for the protein, but the ligand should be less than 2 angstrom. Again, these are not like uh, strong cutoffs. It's recommended to have them less than 2 angstrom. Um, and uh, you need to look at the individual data points for the RMST. Looking at the mean RMST does not tell you that much because let's say you have a ligand that just unbinds and binds again. And so if it's binding and unbinding, then you can have an RMST of five angstrom. And if it binds, you can have an RMST of two angstrom. And so the average would be around 3.5, something like that. It's, if you're trying to publish your data, they always, it's always recommended to have the individual RMST points for your entire simulation in either the main paper or in the supporting information. Thank you. Um... Uh, there's a question, um, is MD simulation done on Galaxy? That is use Galaxy platform. Uh, does that work better? I'm not sure of what the use Galaxy platform is. Uh, do you have any idea? Um, I'm not sure, but I think it's a different uh, platform other than Desmond to do MD. Uh, no, no. I'm not sure. But I think yeah. we can only answer about Desmond here. Um, yeah. yeah, right. Um, okay. Uh, the next question is whether we have to perform docking before MD. Are we using the output of docking study for MD simulation studies? Um, and also, yeah, I think, yes, that is what we were primarily discussing. Um, but you can also do ligands as mentioned before um so the next question is can we do protein protein md simulations on desmond yes you can do protein protein md simulations you can do protein rna you can do protein ligand you can do uh, protein dna as well you can 
you can do for simulations for any molecule that you can think of. Okay, uh, another question is again on hardware a little bit. Uh, so it's just a general question. Can we run Desmin in virtual partition having Linux installed in a Windows system? The answer is yes. Yes, but you need to have the right GPUs. Um, the other question is, why do we need to modify the protein? Because we modify during in silico later in the case of in vivo, how the ligand was stable. Um, do you understand the question? Should I repeat it again? Um, no, I'm not sure what the modification uh -huh. for the protein is in this particular case is. Um, if yeah, I, I, just, I think it could yeah. be just a general question. Uh, maybe we came to prepare from, the protein before yeah. the calculation. Um, but uh, if you are talking about why we need to do the simulations, then the protein is going to move and it's also going to move in in vivo as yeah. well. It's never a static structure in vivo, also. So if the modification is pertaining to the protein structure, uh, then simulations will help. But I don't understand the question perfectly, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you'd want to, you can just email us the question if we did not understand it properly. Um, okay, sorry, these are just the new questions. I have not read them before. Um, okay, so proteins in human physiology stay in a variable ionic environment then how we keep a neutral environment? Uh, yes, so in simulations, you can have, you have the option of trying to set a pH for your calculation. So you can, and you can also have uh, simulations being done at constant pH as well, where if the constant pH value was at this place, at, at the value where you can have a charged state and an uncharged state, you can also do those things in the simulation as well. Uh, it, you cannot vary the pH while the simulation is happening, but you can definitely try to study an interaction where you can have a hydrogen atom being added or a charge being lost. Uh, those things are possible as well. Again, it depends on what you're trying to study. Uh, it's not necessary that the pH has to be at seven. You can modify the pH. You can do a calculation with different pH. Thank you. Uh, I think next is just a general uh question, how can we avoid ligand binding with other proteins? Um, so uh, you have to do experimental studies to find that out. Uh, there is no clear way for you to do it. One thing that you can do is to cross talking, but uh, again, you have to do an experiment to find out if your ligand is binding to some other protein. Um, and so yeah, I and mean, if your if your setup is pro pro proper, like if you do your docking well, if you do your simulations well, then you can be sure that the ligand is going to interact with your protein of with the protein of your choice. But you always have to do an experiment to confirm that is true or not. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is um, okay. An ensemble is a collection of all possible systems which have different microscopic states but have an identical macroscopic or thermodynamic state. What does that mean? And is that the right ensemble that we are talking about? Uh, so no, that's a different ensemble. Uh, so there are the NPT, NVT, NPAT and NP gamma T, they're all different ensembles that is assigned for doing the simulation. But the ensembles that are being talked that is that is being mentioned in this particular question is refers to a different ensemble. So ensemble is a set of different conformations that you can have. Uh, for example, you can have a protein bound to a ligand, or you can have a conformation where the ligand is unbound to the protein. So if you want to think of a macroscopic state, one macroscopic state in that scenario would be that the protein ligand bound form is one macroscopic state. The other macroscopic state is the protein ligand unbound form. Now, within the protein ligand bound macroscopic form on some uh, state, 
you can also have different conformations of the ligand and the protein because they are dynamic in nature. So the protein atoms are moving, the ligand atoms are moving within the same state. They're still bound to each other, but they're moving still. And the, those particular individual states within the protein ligand bond microscopic state are referred to as microscopic states. And the same thing applies for protein ligand unbound states, which is a microscopic state, but you can have the ligand diffusing in the solvent and you can have the protein changing by itself. And so those individual states of the protein and the ligand, which are unbound to, when they're unbound, can be called as individual microscopic states. I hope that is clear. Yes, thank you, Dr. Gaushik. Uh, the next question is, what is the best approach or the steps to be followed in the case of known ligands? Like, should we start with docking or MD or should we start with SAR studies? Um, it depends on the number of ligands that you have. Usually you might only know like 10 or 15 ligands. When you have 10 or 15 ligands, it's always good to uh, uh, first look at what are the features of those ligands that are interacting with the MD, uh, with, with the protein. Even before you do any of the calculations, it's just good to look at the interactions between the ligand and the protein. And once you know, like, you know, why particular ligands have a higher potency or why some of the ligands have a lower potency, then you can go with any of the options that you have. So if you have 10, 15 ligands, you can go for uh, MD or advanced MD methods like FEP to identify which one is the strongest binding. Um, or if you don't have the protein structure, if you only have known ligands, then you have to go for SAR studies, which we're going to cover tomorrow. But there is no like strict way as to how you approach that particular problem. Uh, it's a case by case basis. You have to take a decision for yourself. Um, and uh, if you have any doubts, you can always like email us and we can get back to you on that. Uh, but there is no strict way as to this is how we should do it. It all depends on what the particular study is and what you're trying to answer. Right, moving on to the next question. Um if or what are the enhanced sampling methods that are available in Schrodinger? Schrodinger supports metadynamics. It also supports replica exchange molecular dynamics. Um, those two are, uh, are helpful if you want to study like ligand binding and unbinding and it's, uh, it, it makes the uh, event happen faster. Um, and uh, there are other ones too. I can get back to you by email. Just send an email to us and we'll get back to you on that. What all other sampling methods are available. Um, but these two are, there are a few that are there. Right. Uh, the next question is, is it always possible to get good force field parameters for ligands for MD simulation? In most cases, yes. It's difficult for if you have metal ions, uh, metal as a ligand. Uh, in those particular cases, it's difficult to get good parameters for the ligand. But if you don't have uh, metals, if it's just a simple uh, uh, organic compound, then in most cases, you can get good parameters for ligands. Um, the next question is, can... Sorry. Um, okay. Uh, the next question is, can Desmin be used for a nanoparticle and target MD study? Yes, you can simulate nanomembranes and uh, in, uh, in, in using Desmond. Um, it's possible using Schrodinger, so you can definitely do that. Uh, it doesn't matter what your molecule is, as long as you have the parameters, the force field for it, you can always do the calculation and uh, you can definitely do like uh, nanoparticles and all of that stuff. You can look at the material science suite that we have um, and if you have any other further questions on that, you can always send an email to uh, to me or to any of the Schrodinger team, and we can get back to you. Right. Uh, so I think we just have two more questions. Um, what? Yes. Sorry. Uh, what if we use two different force fields for docking and MD simulations? You can do it. It's not going to be an issue as long as the force fields are accurate enough. But if you already have one particular force field, if you know it is working well, then just stick to one force field just to be consistent. Uh, you are the researcher and you need to justify why you use two different force fields. 
Um, in some cases, there might be a strong reason for you to do it, but in most cases, using the same force field should work uh, for both MD and docking. Right. Um, now we have some general questions. Um, how can we study toxicity in Schrodinger? Is there a module and what module? There is a module called Kickprop, which we are going to cover tomorrow, I think. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, the next question is, uh, can we take a protein which is already bound to a ligand and dock another ligand to it to study allosteric binding? The short answer is yes. Um, you can uh, definitely do that. Uh, you can do it using docking and also using MD simulations, but you need to identify where the allosteric binding pocket is. Uh, and so if you know where the elastic binding pocket is, then it's easier to do it. Even if you don't know it, you can always find the elastic binding pockets using the tools that are available in Studinger. And uh, for if you want to do an MD simulation with the elastic binding pocket, then it's recommended for you to start your simulation where the second ligand is close to the elastic binding pocket. There are some studies where they try to do uh, have the protein and both the ligands in uh, in a solvent and they try to see which one binds where, but that requires a lot of computing power. It, it can be done, you can do any calculation the way you want to do, it just depends on how many, uh, how much computing power you have and uh, how long you can you're willing to spend on it. Thank you, uh, we received uh, one new question, how to keep chlorine ions? in the chloride binding pocket, say in some kinases during MD simulation, as I have seen it moves out while performing simulations. So if you want to restrain any atom in a simulation, you can do that by adding restraints to it. You have to identify what restraints are suitable for each case. Uh, you, because the atoms are moving, I wouldn't recommend you to use uh, positional restraints, but you can always define a restraint as like a interaction between the chlorine ion and some other ion that you know has to interact. Uh, you can have a harmonic potential, which is going to move the chlorine atom, uh, chlorine ion uh, within a certain range. So there are different ways to look at it. I'm not sure how this particular case, what is the best restraint that you can put for this particular case. Uh, send an email to us and we'll get back to you on that. Thank you. Uh, I think there was another question about if you can run a MD simulation on Jupyter Notebook. Uh, the question is no, it is an IDE as far as I know. Um, if you have any comments on that, Dr. Kaushik. There are freely available modules that you can import in the Jupyter Notebook that can do MD simulations, but I haven't never done it. And I don't know how easy it is. Uh, and if I can think, if I'm the way I'm thinking, it might be possible to do it, but I just have no idea how to do it. Um, you can also write your own MD program. If you are an MD program in Python, you can always import it in, in Jupyter Notebook and you can run your calculation. So it's just an ID as Shelby has said, it depends on if you have the module to import into Jupiter and uh, to do the calculation. So it's possible to do it, but uh, I wouldn't really recommend doing it. Yeah, and also Desmond cannot be imported at least directly. And uh, also Galaxy, I think you asked the same question. It is also something similar to that. And uh, yes, I don't think you can get the source code of Desmond also imported there. That is not allowed. Okay. Um, I don't think there are any more questions. Um, Thanks, Shilvia. Thank you, Dr. Koshi, for answering those questions and uh, for the presentation. Um, I think, uh, yes, we have a few announcements. Um, so I think today, this morning, uh, you must have received the form for evaluation. Uh, the email is sent uh, via ddcourse.schrodinger.com and please make sure that you check your promotions and the spam uh, section as well of your inbox. Uh, so it might have gone there. 
um it was slightly delayed apologies for that i think i mentioned that it will be sent to you on friday and i i i received a lot of queries and some co phone calls that it was not sent uh, so there were a lot of people who were still registering uh, that is why we um, put it on hold and it was sent today this morning um so if you want to avail evaluation license which is a a stand alone license that will work on your own machine uh make sure that your hardware matches uh with the minimal configuration that we have mentioned in the form if you have any other uh configuration that is not mentioned uh you may write that in the other column of the hardware question um and we'll look at it and uh, we will see if we can support that or not um so uh, an evaluation license uh just uh, basically means that you will get a license for a month that you can run on your computer so you will receive all the uh, all the modules that we've been talking about um as you know desmond cannot run on windows or mac so you will need a linux uh, system operating system and also supported gpus in order to run desmond um the other thing is uh, we also talked about the shoringer online course so if you do not have the hardware or you would just like to uh, explore our shoringer online course uh we will be sharing the discount codes for you um uh, the the website uh, i think i should just share my screen one second right uh if you can see my screen now uh the website uh, where you can know uh, more about the shodinger online course is shodinger.com/online-online-learning uh, uh so you can actually uh, go to this website and know more about the course uh, it is a self paced course like something like a coursera course if you've taken before um so you will uh, you can finish it on your own time and uh, they it will also be followed by a case study where you can actually implement whatever you learn uh, after completion of this course you'll receive a certificate and also a badge and you will also become a part of a uh, shodinger alumni uh, linkedin page um the other thing is if you haven't uh, requested a website account on our uh, on shodinger.com website please do so um here is the link uh, so it is uh, just shodinger.com/request-account um so you will need this in order to register for the online course and also for our evaluation license so we cannot give you a license unless you are registered on our website this is a separate registration this is not same as the registration for this course um so if you if you haven't registered for this course you have to do that as well so that you can do from here you can go www.shoringa.com slash dd course and you can register to this course um but to get the license and to get the soc the shoringa online course you will have to get a account as well uh, the account might take 48 hours to get activated so please do not panic it takes some time because we manually approve them uh, that's why make sure that you fill in all the necessary information all uh, correctly also make sure that uh, if you have an institutional email please use that instead of using your personal ones uh because that makes the approval process much easier and you will get the online uh, account activated much sooner um the other most important announcement is that uh we have some many um uh, so we have many interesting presentations coming up from our industry partners 
So uh, these are the um, uh, people who are working on the field, in the field, and uh, they are uh, they have some great insights to uh, computational drug design. Um, so these are some of our partners from India and Europe. So there will be a new schedule that will be updated on the website and also an email will be sent to you uh, with all the details of these uh, new presentations. Uh, we already have uh, a few of them lined up. So uh, we have one on this Saturday by Sinjin International. Uh, the presentation is on the same uh, time at 10 a.m. on the October 3rd, the Saturday. Uh, we usually do not have presentations on Saturday and Sundays, but this is an exception as uh, Friday is a holiday. So we do not have any presentation on Friday, October 2nd, uh, as it's a national holiday uh, in India. So instead of Friday, we have a presentation on Saturday and then again, we'll have from Monday to Friday. Um, so make sure you keep uh, checking your emails and also you can go to our website account, which is shodinga.com slash DD course um, in order to get more information on the upcoming presentations. So uh, that's all announcements I have for today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prachwal and Dr. Koshik for the presentation. Thank you all of you for uh, submitting some of the questions. And uh, thank you all the panelists for helping me with the questions um, and the support. Um, I would also like to thank the uh, JSS and Manipal IT team for hosting these sessions for us. Um, thank you all of you and have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Julia. Uh, Ravinder sir, uh, I think you can stop the live session. Uh, sure sir, I'm stopping now. Yeah, thank you.